Hi, everybody. This is Tracy Malone from NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. When people are in, involved in abusive relationships, we often have wounds, and each wound can be unique and overwhelming. In narcissistic abuse relationships, there's always some sort of betrayal, and we have to deal with that as a wound. But there's also aftershocks, the hidden wounds that we must learn to identify and then heal them. The, the wound we're going to talk to today is going to be about abandonment. And I'm going to share you with you this little tiny story that I thought had no bearing on my entire life, but it actually imprinted my entire life. When I was five years old, my father left, never saw him again, knew daddy was there. It didn't seem to really bother me, at least not as much as it affected my sisters who longed for my dad and looked for him their, their whole life. I was like, next, okay, life goes on. I don't have an abandonment wound, who me? Until I be became involved with a narcissistic abuse relationship. And I learned that I had been a victim of abuse my whole life from family members, a husband, a boyfriend. When I learned about Susan Anderson's work, this is on abandonment and outer child work, things I didn't understand about that daddy leaving me was A, that's not the only way we get abandonment wounds, but that was one I needed to explore, I needed to look at. And I realized by not facing that wound, it caused me to marry and get involved with men that would usually abuse me, neglect me, abandon me. That abandonment fear was buried so deep inside of me, and I had these recordings in my head that I was simply not good enough. And this was repeated over and over. Today, my guest is Dr. Susan Anderson. She's an expert on abandonment, and she's going to help us understand this wound and how we identify if we have this wound and what do we do to get it taken care of. I've done so much work on this abandonment stuff, and I'm telling you, it's a lot better on the other side of it. So without any further ado, let's welcome Susan. Welcome, Susan. Thank you so much for joining me. It's wonderful to be here. I have wanted to interview you for so long because I find that the abandonment wound is something that so many victims of abuse suffer with. Can we start out by talking about what the abandonment wound is? Well, it's something universal. So anyone really can identify with it. Of course, some people have a, a more festering wound than others. Uh, but the abandonment is um, the wound that began when we were born because we were in a, a secure womb where everything was done for us and everything was you know, homeostatic. And then we were thrust out into the world, which is bright and cold and you know, very different from the wound, but then picked up again and swaddled and held and then put down again and picked up again later and then I down. So we experienced in our very earliest, you know, conditioning, um, we experienced connection and then disconnection, connection and disconnection. Connection feels delicious and disconnection doesn't feel so great. So the amygdala, which is the part of the brain that registers fear, aversive behavior, we as little humans were conditioned to prefer the comfort and positive feelings of connection and to have an aversion to the experiences of disconnection. So all of us, no matter how ideal our childhood, have an abandonment wound and abandonment fear, primal fear, just because we were all born and went through and still go through that sequence. So, you know, we, the abandonment wound can primarily consists of fear, the fear of not being good enough, the fear of losing someone, the fear of winding up alone and not being accepted, and the shame. Um, there's so much shame. It's not something that is that, that most people are willing to talk about. Lately, people have been admitting to having shame because there's been more spoken about it publicly but only until very recently it's a hidden emotion but it's the feeling that you are afraid of not being worthy of being kept so abandonment is the fear of being thrown away or being not kept but shame is feeling unworthy of being kept that there's something missing in me something fundamentally 
broken or damaged or just not enough, that there's some kind of inadequacy or that, that I just don't have what the rest of the world has, that I don't rate. These feelings of I must not be enough, that these shame feelings are very much part of that abandonment wound. And again, I'm bringing them out in the open. And so now lately, some other people are talking about these feelings, but they're universal. We all have them just to different extents. Thank you. So when somebody has been in a narcissistic relationship or an abusive relationship and something happens where it ends, then they could go back and trigger this uh, original birthing abandonment wound is, is that well being in a in a relationship with someone who's narcissistic it, it puts you in, in a lot of jeopardy because the the narcissist when they need you can engage you and so you're all you're you're all good enough and you're it's great that you're there and so you get this message of connection but it's not about you and the narcissist it's more about the narcissist's needs so when something shifts and some other source is giving the narcissist what it needs or whatever all the different things that change then you are no longer required and so there is a disconnection that really also has nothing to do with you but to be at the other end of that to be that person here i'm with the narcissist and i'm experiencing connection and then disconnection, I will feel that as abandonment. I will feel that I have not been good enough, that I have somehow let that connection go, that I have caused it, that I did something wrong. So it triggers all of those primal fears and insecurities that started out right from the beginning and have been accumulating ever since. And you're, you're talking about them almost compounding. Right? Yes, the, it just keeps getting layered and layered and it does compound. But the good news is that while that wound is getting more complex and layered and more vulnerable, also the rest of us is getting stronger in other areas so that we can balance this to some extent. But then in life, sometimes we get bombarded with a, with a trigger from a narcissist or some other kind of experience and all of the strengths are suddenly don't count for the moment eventually they help us but um and we just feel the overwhelmed feeling of of being rejected and overwhelmed and and not able to cope with it and and life isn't worth living and we're no good and so forth and all of those feelings you know will come to the surface and I know in the in the beginning of this this video, I spoke of my father leaving when I was five, and I thought I was really like, I'm cool. I don't have an abandonment wound. I'm good. But there's a lot of other things besides someone leaving, because that was the misconception I knew for 55 years until I read your work and said, oh, there's a lot more to this. What are other ways that people can get an abandonment wound? Besides. Well, you know, uh, speaking of your father leaving, when you were a kid and he left, you coped with that. You know, children don't identify their feelings very well. They're, they don't go around saying, I feel sad and possibly worthless because dad left and I wasn't important enough for him to stay. You know, they don't even know how to identify that. It's just a mishmash to kids. Mm -hmm. so they, they play or they get distracted or they, they do a million other things. They might... Um, have a pet and then the pet dies and now they're overreacting to the pet mm. where they didn't have any reaction to their father leaving. Mm. But the fact that later on in life, a trigger can arouse those old feelings that as a child, you didn't even know you were having, a later, a trigger can, can suddenly make you feel unimportant, unspecial, um, bereft in some way so it's it's so interesting how we live in a very retroactive way emotionally but so many things far less dramatic things you could be um someone who has a, a slight learning disability and the other children do their math less faster than you do and they're done quicker and what's i must not be special or you could be yelled at by another adult mm -hmm. and 
and feel singled out and that make may make you feel as if all of your worst fears about yourself not quite being as good as the other children suddenly come out it the things that can lead to having you know abandonment feelings as an adult can range so widely they could be that your parents had another baby and now you're no longer the the baby in the family it, it could be something so simple as that or or your parents could be late picking you up from the daycare center and for a half an hour you were panicked that they actually didn't love you and left you there and you would never see them again and when they finally showed up you felt so small and dependent and ashamed of being so puny mm -hmm. and th it, the things that can trigger these this feeling in children are very small and most of those things that children go through are somewhat repetitive for instance if it's the birth of a new baby it doesn't happen once the baby's around so it's every day you have to cope with this or if one of your parents is an alcoholic that's not something that just happened once if that were the case maybe the rest of the experiences would kind of you know soften it but it's a constant thing you're you're let's say it's your mother your mother's an alcoholic well she's um always has a relationship with alcohol that's slightly more important than her relationship with you and although she loves you dearly she's not completely yours because she really belongs to the alcohol so there's this chronic kind of lack of intense you know, connection that you are barely aware of because when you're young you might not even know what an alcoholic is or that alcohol is bad so it's it's the things that can create you know the, the this kind of a feeling of abandonment and create this woundedness it can be very very subtle and they can also be very large you know you can have the death of a parent or a parent can actually abandon the family and things like that can happen um but the these experiences that we have in childhood are not necessarily things we can think back and say, oh, this happened and this happened. It might take a little work to try to piece it together to understand, you know, kind of where you're coming from. Right. Because that it's it's just kind of lost to the history and all the details kind of dissolve. Right. Yeah. I, I when I did your abandonment workshop book. Um, which I recently did the workshop workshop, but when I did the, the book, the workbook, one of the things that popped out in my memory, which literally I had forgotten for 60 years, was to remember a time, and, and I was just like, think of these things, right? They just sort of come into me. When I was nine, I was with stepfather on the Mid-Queens Expressway, and I don't remember the fight. I don't remember what it was, but he said, I'm going to, I want you to get out of the car here and I'm going to drive around and see how long it takes me to get back to you. Oh, and it was at least an hour. And I'm standing in the middle of the, the mid Queens expressway as a nine-year-old cars are stopping. Um, people are like, where's your parents? Where are you? What are you doing here? And I'm like, well, he's going to be right back. And they stayed with me. It was so traumatic, but I completely forgot about it until I did your work where I sat there and looked for these things. And that was a big wound, just that fear of, is he ever going to come? Fear. Where is the he? fear was humbling to you as a child. So that probably explains why you couldn't remember it. Yeah. But at, in that moment, the terror is so tremendous because you don't know if you'll ever see that parent again and what will happen to you from there. It's sort of a fear of death, right. annihilation. It's a very intense thing. Of course, your step parent, whoever did that, didn't realize mm -hmm. what was what would happen to you a little bit insensitive but we won't go there <laughs> uh, but um but parents very often do these things without realizing but at the time you were humbled by that because at that point no matter how unimportant that parent may have seemed when they returned they became the only important source of safety in the world so you became tiny in comparison to them at that moment. 
Mm -hmm. So it really, it really plays havoc with your self esteem mm -hmm. to have been reduced to such a level of fear where someone else becomes so heroic after doing something possibly a little insensitive. I mean, but this, is the, to this is the paradox. Yeah, exactly. There, there's so many layers to it, but um, there was also the what did I do wrong? Yes, you know? imagine. What, what, were we having a fight? I mean, I'm still searching for that. Moment. How did I do this? How did I cause this? What did I do to deserve it? And that stays with you. So uh, enough about that story. I just wanted to throw it in there that because of your workbook, I was able to go and go, what else don't I remember? And things bubble up. When we do the work, we find some answers. Some we don't want to hear. Sometimes, sometimes we need to hear them so that we actually have some kind of you know, groundwork for our, our life. But when, when we were talking in the book, there's stages that people go through, stages of abandonment. I think you call it SWIRL. Can we explain that to the people? Yes, SWIRL is an acronym. It stands for Shattering, Withdrawal, Internalizing, Rage, and Lifting. And the acronym kind of describes the way you go through it. You swirl through those stages within an hour, within a week, within a year. And when you, you hit an abandonment trigger in adulthood, you swirl through the stages or in childhood you swirl, but you're not in touch with, you can't describe it as well. But the shattering part is where the connection feels threatened and it feels as if the rug has been pulled out from underneath you. Well, you stood there waiting for your step parent to pick you up if he ever did. You know, you were shattered, that was shattering. Then in withdrawal is where, oh, please hurry up and come pick me up, oh, please. It's where you yearn for your lover or if so, you've been fired from a job, you yearn to get that security back, to be, to be appreciated, to be valued as an employee. If you've lost your health, you know, you yearn to have your, your health back, to go back to the way it was before when, when you felt whole and, and healthy, you know, whatever it, it is that you've lost that makes you feel as if the rug has come out from underneath you, you yearn for it back, you're in withdrawal. And then internalizing is the very next phase, you kind of overlap into these phases. You blame it on yourself. Well, it's my fault, it's because I always knew that I wasn't special. I always knew there was something wrong with me. I always knew I wasn't worthy. I always knew that somebody would throw me away or whatever it is. So the internalizing is where the wound of abandonment gets infected with shame and low self-esteem. It causes scarring in your self-esteem. It's a very um, critical stage of the wounding because you're taking a beating out on yourself. You're taking the rejection and you're taking it out on yourself. It's really a kind of rage taken out on the self and causes a, a reduction of self-esteem and an increase in shame. And then you feel angry. That's the rage phase. You kind of overlap into, wait a minute, it's not all my fault. And then you kind of repudiate the person who has left you on the street corner or the person who has fired you or rejected you or whatever, the doctor who had the unmitigated gall to say that you were sick and so forth, you, you stand up and you say, no, I refuse to accept this. It's not my fault. And it's a very uncomfortable um, stage of the process because your anger is not comfortable. It's not like, yay, I'm finally angry. It's terribly uncomfortable. Um, and it can be very chronic. People can stay agitated for a very long time. But then after the rage is sort of projected outward, there's a chance for lifting, for letting life pull you back out. So you go from uh, shattering withdrawal, internalizing rage, and then lifting out into life again, and then back into, oh, but I've lost my job. What am I going to do? And then, oh, I wish I had it. And then it's my fault. And then, no, it isn't. And then back out into lifting. You keep going through these stages over and over, cycling through, swirling through. Swirling through. I, I think I remember like swirling like a washing machine in the book. It's just like round and round and, and it, it doesn't, it's, it's not linear. So it's not like, I'm going to get these and then I got to go back down. It could be this and then you can go back. Oh yes. It go, yes. It's this topsy-turvy. You're tossed into the mix. It is a lot like a washing machine. 
is a little bit round and round. But for me, when I'm coaching victims of abuse, um, they seem to always get stuck in the internalizing, the shame. Um, how does someone know? Like in your book, it clearly lays it out when these are the possibilities if you're stuck in this, if you're stuck in this. But internalizing, I would love for you to just say, how do they know that they feel like they're in that internalizing place? Well, the internalizing is where people get stuck. I mean, listen, people can also get stuck in the withdrawal too, where they, they're always feeding their emotional hunger with drugs and food and, and all, you know, drugs and alcohol and people and television and taking naps or being hyperactive. Or, but it's the emotional hunger that we self-medicate with all the substances. Mm -hmm. um, but so they can get stuck there. That's a very common place of stuckness. But the most common place that people get stuck is in internalizing. And I, I would even go so far as to say, we're all a little stuck in internalizing. All it would take for me, and I've, I'm very, um, I, I feel terrific about life and myself and the work that I do and everything, but all it would take would be to somebody slam a door in my face and even if I can work my way out of it pretty quickly, what, where I would go with that is, well, yep, see, uh, it's my whole childhood and all of those feelings would come to the surface because the truth is we don't get rid of those feelings. We learn how to cope with them and surround them with more positive feelings. We learn how to know where they come from and so forth so they don't control us. So. I have the tools to quickly come out of those feelings and bring myself back to where I was and even use it as strength to, to go further. But most people who really have a lot of abuse have such a repetitive onslaught of messaging that makes them feel so ashamed. They have a very hard time and they really need tools to, to move out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what you offer, you know, besides the book, the book, people, the book, we'll put the link down below. This is my treasure. Literally a hundred people a week get the link to that to go buy it because I'm telling them you have to start to look at this wound. You need to open the door and just say what's in there. And some people will come back and say, that was so hard but I'm glad I did it, or I struggled through that chapter and I, I made it through. It's about looking at it so that it isn't this thing in the dark, right? You have to shine light on it so that you can start to heal it. So can people recover from an abandonment wound? You said it could always just keep trigger and come back, but with your- They do, they do, they can recover and they do recover. And when, um, sometimes like when you go to conventional therapy and you open up your feelings, you're in your feelings and you could almost stay in your feelings and kind of stay sad for a while with conventional therapy if you have an abandonment wound. It won't necessarily take that wound and lift it uh, quickly. But when you touch base with those feelings in an abandonment recovery program, such as the one that I'm, I'm promoting, you don't just feel the feelings, you take them and use them. You use them to create a dialogue with yourself because those feelings form the basis of a brand new relationship with yourself. One that is stronger and deeper than anything you've ever had before. So, I mean, just using your example and you and I don't know each other beyond this conversation, but I can tell and you probably no, no, within yourself that when you had that experience that you didn't even remember being left with you know not knowing if you were going to live or die and would you ever see your stepfather again would you be on this hell huh? would you be just you know blown over and run over by cars and trucks um that you uh those feelings were once connecting became a reason to have compassion for yourself so that when you go to a place of self-love and giving yourself a little pat and having a connection with yourself, you go to a deeper place because of those feelings. So the idea is that no matter what feelings you begin to identify with, 
They're, they become a well of ink that you can dip a pen in and write new life. They become a source of growth. But in order to really get them to work for you, you need to create this new relationship with yourself that involves two things. It involves writing a dialogue, which has, you know, step-by-step -step instructions. You need, it, there's a whole thing involved with it that you need to do it, um, but also using your imagination to personify the part of you that that happened to. And then you personify yourself as the adult, loving, caring self that can actually help yourself. So you use your imagination to create, to separate the, the person who felt all of that and who feels all of that from the part of the person that can really take care of you and so that imagination can really perform incredible um, feats of, of healing within the self. I make it sound like it's something that happens by osmosis. And of course it doesn't. It's step by step. That's why there are so many books, you know, explaining how to do it, workshops and so forth, because it is a process that you have to actually work. But that process is not difficult. Mm -hmm. It's just... It just takes a little effort and time, but it works. It does. And, and I will ask you if, if you don't mind to, to talk about the, the workshop that like I was just in, it was a month ago or so. And, and it helped me quite a bit, even so far away from this. I just learned that, oh yeah, this is a refresher to what I'd read in all your books. So can you just talk a little about that so people can get an idea of what that would be? Well, that? The workshop is five sessions and it's pretty amazing. Five sessions, a few hours a session, it's an online workshop. Mm -hmm. Next year I'll be running workshops in person at various locations around the country. Those are fabulous also. Um, but the, wor the workshop is bringing people together and then bringing, using this material, the wound, an awareness of the wound, identifying it, sharing it, and bringing people together so they can hear each other and learn from each other. Mm -hmm. Because the shame, which is the cornerstone, is immediately um, responsive to sharing. It immediately responds to that and it, it begins to dissipate. You don't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. You kind of integrate it. And you share it with other people and it, the toxicity from it really, really gets much reduced to the point that with enough sharing over a period of time, you can really come to accept yourself as a human being with, with faults and feel good about that and stop, stop with all the perfectionism and overcompensating and all of that kind of thing and really focus on your strengths and moving yourself forward and succeeding in all of these areas. Um, so the workshop is helpful in that you get to practice the tools which are explained and you practice them right there in the workshop, but with other people and sharing their attempts at using these tools mm -hmm. in order to really experience yourself in a new way. Um, and so I'll do anything I can to present opportunities for people to work together on this stuff mm -hmm. because I, I see I, near miracles happen. I could see that. And, and I'm a big advocate for you. So I, I yes. everyone <laughs> to follow the links that um, we'll put under your name when we, when we push this out here to learn more about your work. And, you know, if nothing else, start with the book. Start with a workbook. Get yourself into a place where, where you can bring this out into the light and then get into one of Susan's workshops if you can. She's going to travel when COVID's over. She's going to travel and be out there again. And if you ever come near Denver, I'm in the group, just so you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sign me up. But um, thank you so much for being here. Um, abandonment is such an important issue and um, discovering it really changed my life. It was oh, so I'm hard. so glad. Thank you so that much. Turned that light on and I was like, 
that's the wound that's so much bigger than all the others because it ties into everything so yes so much for all of the people that you help and for talking with me today oh thank you for having me it's been a pleasure I hope you guys enjoyed that. Abandonment is such a key piece of recovering from narcissistic abuse because it does tap into old wounds that we may or may not know we had. So I wanna thank Susan again for being here and you can find out more about her by visiting her at abandonment.net. So this is Tracy Malone. Visit my website, Narcissist Abuse Support and we'll see you soon. Thank you.